Saber Spark says to David, you've had a good run with the meme, but it's dying out and I feel that you are blaming me for it. Now you gotta put a sour taste in everyone's mouth and people are gonna look at you the same way that they look at Derek Savage from Cool Cat. I don't really think that's a fair comparison and I certainly hope that's not the way that people look at this. What I do appreciate is how candid Saber Spark is basically in saying that he simply doesn't believe that this is fair use. again everybody i hope you're having a fantastic uh tuesday evening or wednesday morning whenever this goes up and i just wanted to basically follow up on my saber spark video i don't want to wade too much into the debate any further than i already have just because i don't really want to become a youtube community commentary channel that's not really where my interests lie frankly i'd just rather be focused on original content but with that said i think there has been some important kind of developments in the story which i think have as i've said before ramifications for the whole youtube community i haven't really heard other commentary or youtube centric news channels talk about this and uh, I think probably that's just because it's not particularly sensationalistic or dramatic, but I think it really is valuable in terms of furthering the discussion. So I think it warrants a little more attention than it's getting, frankly. So just as some background on what has now been, I guess, dubbed the SaberSpark controversy. SaberSpark is a, a YouTuber who reviews mostly cartoons and animation. And SaberSpark posted two videos on Strawinsky and the Mysterious House, which is the video from which the Glob Go Gab Galab memes um, are derived. The creator of the original film took issue with both of Saber Spark's videos. There was some controversy about whether it was a true and valid fair use complaint or concern or whether it was a form of censorship, as there usually is in these circumstances. Since then, Saber Spark received copyright strikes on both videos. Uh, he has since taken down both videos, the long and the short of it is. The copyright strikes have been removed. So as far as I know, neither party actually had to engage their lawyers uh, in discussing this, at least with each other, luckily. And I think they've come to a resolution that they're at least both uh, happy with as a compromise, even if nobody considers it ideal. For me, the main reason that I wanted to make a video about this was because it reflected some feelings and thoughts that I had about the YouTube system that were bothering me, but also because it opened my eyes to just some really fascinating history about the Stravinsky movie that I felt was relevant that nobody else was talking about. About half an hour ago, um, David Hutter, the creator of Stravinsky, posted a comment on my video um, which was sort of the first official response from either parties and he basically included a link to a full transcript of the communication that he had with SaberSpark resulting in this compromise. And at first I have to admit I was a little bit leery because I suspected that maybe both parties were not open or aware to having their communication um, publicly displayed but it seems like David Hutter did very respectfully request permission to post this. SaberSpark acknowledged receipt of that email, and so hopefully he's okay with this being out here as well. In case I haven't made it clear enough, I'm actually, uh, I consider myself a big fan of both these parties in this case, so I just want everybody to get along at the end of the day. And I think for the most part, they kind of found a way to do that. I feel like maybe SaberSpark is a little more bitter at how things turned out, understandably. But to SaberSpark's credit, he's also asked his fans and followers to basically be as respectful as possible and not to lash out at David Hutter or anyone else. And I don't think it needs to be said, particularly for my audience, but I hope anyone watching this, regardless of your opinion, and I invite you to discuss and debate in the comments below, but please keep it as respectful as possible. So without further ado, let's jump into the actual email exchange exchange between SaberSpark, aka Stephen Carver, and David Hutter, aka the animator director of the Glob Go Gab Galab film. So it seems like the first communication that was made was basically David Hutter initiating a copyright strike against the entire Let's Watch, which SaberSpark has hence admitted extended the definition of fair use and was reasonable to be taken down. Nonetheless, SaberSpark followed up by emailing David Hutter just to gain some clarity on the situation. And right off the bat, we can see that he's very understandable and respectful in his tone. He can say, I understand where you're coming from. It's your movie. It's getting a wave of attention and you want to protect it. Also, my Let's Watch was stepping over the line as far as fair use goes, so I will avoid that in the future. All in all, he says he apologizes for what has happened. And he asks if it's possible to remove the strike from the channel and he promises not to re-upload the offending content in that case. Stephen Hutter responds the next day, which is understandable because of the time difference, especially between the US and the UK. And his email is quite in depth. It includes, in my mind, some valid points about fair use and some kind of criticisms of the review, which while interesting, are particularly relevant to its 
status as being fair use or not. In other words, I think it's fair that because David Hutter thought that he was recognizing a genuine uh, example of a violation of fair use, that he would then judge the content for how harmful it was to his film or his brand or his intellect intellectual property and base his response on that. Obviously, if it was a full out promotional piece, uh, if he's the copyright owner, it's, it's completely his right to leave that up if he thinks it's gonna help him sell products. And it makes sense that in some ways he might want to justify why he's not leaving it up given that he considers it fair use. He makes some of the same points that I did in my video basically about how long it took him to make this film. But essentially what he's saying at the end of the day is that Saber Sparks review was not fair because of the circumstances under which the film was made or what the narrative was according to David Hutter. To be completely frank, I think it would have served David Hutter better not to bring up any of this information at all if it's fair use and he thought it was harmful to his brand. That's all he really needed to say. I, <laughs> I, I can only imagine how hard it is as a creator not to try and defend your own work when there is rampant criticism. But I think at the end of the day, it pretty much never serves you well. And so while I actually agree with most of the points he's making, I also think that Saber Sparks review was one of his honest interpretations of the film and that there was nothing wrong with it as a piece of critique. And I also happen to think, frankly, that the original review video from Saber Spark was fair use. And so that's my biggest frustration with this whole case. But with that said, my perspective has changed a little bit because I didn't realize just how much thought David Hutter had obviously put into this. In fact, in this email exchange, he stipulates, I believe, that basically he specifically noted in the copyright complaint to YouTube that he took issue with a particular portion of the review beginning after the seven minute mark where it was running through basically the entire contents of the film. And for some perspective, Saber Sparks review all in all was about 27 minutes, whereas the original Strawinsky video is just over half an hour. So they are very similar in length. And obviously Saber Sparks review includes a lot of the original content. And David Hutter also links to some other material basically on the definition of fair use and some particular points in his eyes where he thinks it is in violation of fair use. Although Saber Sparks video I do think was probably longer than it had to be to make the core arguments, I do think that every minute of it was genuinely commentary and critique on a different particular aspect of the story and the film. So I'm pretty torn on this one. At the end of the day, if I were the copyright holder, I like to think I probably would have let it slide, but it's hard for me to give David Hutter a hard time under the circumstances because he did really research this and look into this, and I think he makes quite a strong case for why he did not consider it fair use. Reading this email exchange also just reinforces a couple of points that I made last time, basically that uh, as I suspected, David Hutter perhaps was reacting out of uh, frustration more than anything at the lack of effectiveness of YouTube's copyright system from the other side, from, from the perspective of a copyright holder, in that he was being overrun by pirated copies that would go up on YouTube. And even once he got them taken down, he wasn't recouping any of the profit that they made or or basically deprived him of potentially. And then he was just generally frustrated by the response of the YouTube community in not defending his intellectual property. Perhaps most importantly, this email exchange just confirms basically that David was actually really clear about uh, a threat essentially to remove the second video after putting a copyright strike on the first video. And Saber Spark, to me, kind of expressed that this came to him as a bit of a surprise, that he got two out of three potential copyright strikes, meaning he was one copyright strike away from potentially losing his channel, which is a very worrying place to be in. Um, but this reveals that he did, in fact, have basically a week between receiving a warning and actually getting the second strike. So again, under the circumstances, I think David Hutter's response was more than gracious. So there's really no communication between April 3rd and April 10th. And I have to imagine that the second email coming from David Hutter with no response from Saber Spark was just prompted by some discussion on social media that I was not privy to, because it seems like there's sort of a, a lack of communication in between here. Uh, David Hutter notes on the 10th that, I'm surprised that the second takedown notice is a shock to you. After all, in my last email, I said I was planning to submit a takedown notice of the video and wanted to wait for you to take it offline yourself so you can keep the advertising revenue basically indicating that he wanted or was willing for SaberSpark to keep the ad revenue. SaberSpark says to David, you've had a good run with the meme, but it's dying out and I feel that you are blaming me for it. Now you gotta put a sour taste in everyone's mouth and people are gonna look at you the same way that they look at Derek Savage from Cool Cat. I don't really think that's a fair comparison and I certainly hope that's not the way that people look at this. What I do appreciate is how candid SaberSpark is basically in saying that he simply doesn't believe that this is fair use. Because personally, I believe it is fair use and so do many of my colleagues. If the lawyer 
players think the same, I am going to fight this. And that's a perfectly reasonable request. I have no issue with that. And it makes sense that if he was considering engaging a legal team, he would not respond to David Hutter. And then Saberspark basically says that uh, he's going to wait and see what his legal team says, but then he follows that up with saying, if you want to remove the strikes, we can leave it at that, and I won't upload the review to my channel again. So Saberspark concludes the email by saying, all right, let me know what you think. I'm up for the removal of the strikes in exchange for leaving the videos off my channel for good. But if you don't want to do that, I might have to fight you on this one, dude. And he says, as a reviewer, freedom of speech means a lot to me, so I can't just stand by him. And no matter what I feel about David Hunter and what I feel about constitutes fair use and me being on the fence about it, I actually respect Saber Spark more for being driven to stand up for what he essentially believes in. And as much as I appreciate that this could be resolved with relatively little drama or legal action, I do kind of feel for Saber Spark knowing that he still thinks it is fair use and obviously being very tempted to just stand up for what he believes in and basically to fight this to the bitter end. And I have to say I would respect him in that decision um, probably as much as I respect him in the decision to just close this um, as peacefully and calmly and with as few hard <laughs> Uh, feelings as possible. David Hutter responds again that same day and it's more just a courtesy notice to kind of try and share his um, feelings on the situation and why he was driven to enact the copyright strikes in the first place uh, in response to Saber Spark's last comments. And this is where he asked basically for permission to put this entire conversation uh, into the public domain so there's a clear record of what happened. And Saber Spark responds, I'm glad we can find some common ground. Let's move forward with that agreement then. And David also clarifies on the 10th that if Saber Spark wanted to upload a shorter review video with basically the same points and the same comments, he would be absolutely fine with that because it was in fact the length of the video and the amount of copyrighted content used in it that he was taking issue with and not exclusively the critiques. And probably the best news in this for all of us as viewers is that Saber Spark is planning to upload another Glob Go Gab Galab edit. And again, to my earlier point, Saber Spark says on April 10th, quote, I'm going to make a video letting my viewers know what happened, but it will be legit. No name calling, no witch hunting, nothing like that. I'm only going to tell them that you and I found common ground and then I'll upload a shorter version of the video at some other time. Which actually, now that I read that, implies maybe that he wasn't aware that this whole uh, exchange was going online. So um, I don't know, let me know Saberspark if, if you want me to take down this video, I absolutely will. But in an age where it seems like so many YouTubers are willing to basically just ignore the actions of their fans or secretly provoke them into taking things into their own hands. I really genuinely do appreciate the way that Saberspark is basically requesting that calmer heads prevail in this whole debate. So in my last video, I guess I was basically saying, I hope this can serve as an example of how this can be resolved the right way and what the alternative is to the whole Derek Savage H3H3 situation. Um, is this situation perfect? No, it's far from it. Uh, is it a fair compromise? Just about. I think it's a, the best that we could hope for under the circumstances. What did we learn from this email exchange? We learned uh, David Hutter did give Saber Spark fair warning and clear justification for why he thought the content was not fair use and when he planned to remove it. Both Saber Spark and David honored the original resolution of removing both videos in exchange for both video strikes. Looking back at this, it's maybe still hard not to kind of consider this as some type of censorship in a way because obviously David Hutter was sensitive to the critiques in Saber Spark's video, but on the other hand, the way that David Hutter justified the video being in violation of fair use kind of negates any of that argument. It's sort of a shame that we won't be able to use this whole example as a case study, if you will, in terms of where the actual line is in fair use if they had brought this actually, if this had entered the court of law and became um, a reference case or there was an actual legal debate. But on the other hand, the value of that would be questionable because every case is so unique and so different. And I think we can all agree that it's probably best that neither party had to shell out big bucks for legal fees only to ultimately probably come to an, an even more unsatisfactory uh, conclusion. I think there could have been a much more satisfactory resolution though had YouTube systems just been um, able to accommodate it a little bit more. So again, I can relate to both these creators, both as a YouTuber and as somebody who's been responsible for taking down pirated material on YouTube. And I know what a hassle it is on both sides. And I can understand where YouTube's coming from and that this is a very hard problem to address. But I do feel like if some very simple changes were made to uh, YouTube's copyright reporting system, we could have had actually a much better resolution here. Let me clarify that. So I think I might've mentioned very briefly, but I wanna go into more depth 
that there's actually two types of copyright reporting uh, mechanisms, uh, main kind of mechanisms on YouTube. So one is the content ID system, which is an automated system where a copyright holder uploads their content and basically AI sort of crawls the content and actually identifies matches to the picture or the audio in other material that's uploaded to YouTube. So let's say, I create a movie and I put the whole thing in my content ID system, then YouTube will automatically detect any time that a scene or a song or something else from that video content is uploaded by a reviewer. And as you can imagine, the system is pretty sensitive and it tends to just automatically flag and pull down basically anything with any matches, including every instance of fair use, which is why it's so frustrating as a YouTube creator. As the content copyright holder, you can set the parameters in terms of whether it just flags it for your individual review, whether it monetizes it, but you collect the profit instead of the person who uploaded the review, or of course you can set it to just automatically block everything. You still have the opportunity to manually review it and release it later, but how many copyright holders are really gonna do that, especially when it means scanning through literally hundreds of pirated videos to find those few legitimate ones. I speculated also in my original video and I think this conversation confirms that David Hutter did not have a content ID system and he was manually reviewing and flagging and having to find every individual copyrighted version of his movie, which is a huge waste of time. As a small copyright owner, it's very frustrating how hard it is to get a content ID application approved so that you can upload content for content ID. Mostly it's just the big studios that have it at this point. And that's understandable considering the kind of legal gray area here. And if this tool was in the hands of people who shouldn't have it, obviously who don't even maybe own the content or are putting up content that they claim is theirs, but isn't, it could get very messy. And legally it could get quite dangerous even for YouTube, I would imagine. Is it ever possible that the content and ID system that that AI will be smart enough to detect or determine what might or is fair use. I don't think that's imaginable in the near future, maybe a, a decade from now. Right now, I think the best we can hope for is that YouTube instates a better review process so that if somebody appeals a decision that's made essentially by an AI computer, that they have as much or more weight than the original copyright holder, which now is clearly not the case. But it's not just that system of appeals that's different. The whole system basically built around the content ID system is quite quite different because the copyright holder can choose to monetize instead of blocking or deleting or flagging and causing a copyright strike on the channels who upload this material. So for instance, my entire channel isn't monetized at this point because I don't have enough subscribers, but there was a point when I was monetized and some of my earlier videos, the video recall videos, were flagged by you know Warner Brothers or whatnot. They didn't enact a copyright strike, thankfully. They just received all the revenue from those videos. And those videos were like three minutes and there was like, you know, maybe 30 seconds of copyrighted material in most of them. But, you know, as a new creator, I was okay with that because I was just looking to share an opinion and get my content kind of seen and, and, uh, and spark a discussion. But as a copyright holder, when you manually flag a video, when you go and report something, it's just like flagging something for offensive material of any other kind. And it's basically an all or nothing system of removing the video. You can't ask YouTube to remove the video but not enact a copyright strike and you certainly can't apply to receive the profits but have the video continue to be visible on YouTube. In my mind, I think a copyright resolution system that actually allowed for revenue sharing between the original copyright holder and those uploading iterative work would be a win-win in so many ways. For instance, I would still argue that Saber Specs review video is his own original content because it is fair use and commentary and that he should be able to receive the profits, but maybe as a backup plan, at least he would receive 50% profit instead of having the video removed altogether. A better example might be his first video, which was a, a Let's Watch, in which he literally did watch the entire video with limited commentary throughout. In that case, he admitted that he may have overstepped the boundaries of what fair use is, but on the other hand, he was still essentially promoting the content, building awareness for it, and I still think that kind of content can be a win-win for both con content creators and, you know, film producers. So what if there was a system where they could actually voluntarily share the revenue from a, from a video like that through YouTube's copyright system? Frankly, I think it would cut down significantly on the number of appeals from YouTube. I think most people would realize that that's sort of a reasonable common ground in a lot of situations. Situations. And on limiting appeals and disputes, I think it would cut down on the amount of administration that YouTube has to do for copyright um, complaints and hopefully would free them up to actually address more individual cases that right now, frankly, aren't addressed at all when you simply can't get through to a YouTube representative. Anyways, guys,
guys. I feel like I've already gone a lot longer than I wanted to. There's a few other videos that I wanted to prepare today uh, and I'm way behind. So I'm gonna get back to work on those. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And thanks so much for the comments on my last video and keeping it uh, sane and respectful and insightful and keeping this important topic on YouTube and copyright protection moving forward. Again, if you guys haven't already, I do hope you check out Hope Animation to view the entire Strawinsky movie. I hope you guys check out Saber Sparks channel and look forward to his uh, upcoming shorter review video. And if you enjoy conversations just like this one, I hope you click subscribe and tap the bell for notifications. Thanks again for watching guys. I'm Joseph, this is Buzzcuts. Appreciate your eyeballs today and stay strange.